Good morning and welcome to Sacred Enzyme. I hope you're having a great morning and that you're doing well and in good spirits. Today I'm going to talk about a really touchy subject and uh, for people that get offended easy, you're probably not at the right place because I'm a truth teller and I speak the truth and sometimes it makes people uncomfortable. But today we need to have a talk about uh, where we come from and how we're just all in this together. And we've been conditioned and brainwashed for centuries to believe that because our skin is either dark or light, that we should be different, that we're different inside and we're not. And we've created all of these ideas and, you know, and it happens because of fear. It happens because of pain and trauma. And, you know, a lot of people are carrying around trauma and it's come back to manifest. I mean, we had a lot of uh, buried trauma that came up during the uh, BLM things. And the reason that this happens is it's a spiritual reason. It's when we have generations and generations of karma and trauma built up in our family lines that they're going to manifest. So we got to go back. We're looking at seven generations here. So we're talking about uh, the time of the 1700s, 16 to 1700s here is what we're looking at. And uh, we're looking at this time period and, and a lot of things were happening. It was a big reset. And the way um, I have... Uh, I've went about this is is that I've tried to follow the facts. I've tried to use our genealogy and uh, f trace our past because your genetics are not going to lie. Your genetics are not going to lie. People will lie to you. Governments will lie to you. Establishments will lie to you. Controlling tyrant manipulative people will lie to you. But what you are, the core of what you are, your God particle and your DNA does not lie. And so the one subject that I want to talk about is a lot of um, a lot of people that come from Africa or originally came from Africa or they may not even came from Africa. They just have black skin or dark brown skin. You know, they have what they would think is African-American skin. But when they do their uh, DNA, they come back that they're like 40 percent European or, you know, Northwest European predominantly. And a lot of people think this is because they came here and they became slaves for these people. But I want to set forth a different hypothesis that I think is accurate. And what I think is, th what I think is the true origin of all of us. And I think that uh, a lot of people that have this genetics, these this 40, 40%, 45%, some people have almost 50% Northwest European. And uh, you'll have a little Spanish, you could have a little Italian, you could have a little uh, Baltic, uh, Lithuanian, uh, German. You could have a few little degrees of this, that, and the other. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a reason that you have Scottish, Irish, you have Iberian uh, blood is because your ancestors lived there. Yes, folks, you didn't go there because you were taken and you were a slave. You went there because you came from a technologically advanced civilization. They were also, a lot of them were known as Berbers, but uh, you know, uh, these people were highly evolved, intelligent, very technologically advanced uh, people. And they lived all around the Mediterranean basin. I know I'm sounding like a broken record because I keep going on and on about this. But we got to talk about this because as long as, as the world is at odds with each other and we can put up walls and divisions with each other because we think you can't understand me because I'm, I have, you know, because I'm like a Christian and you can't understand me because I'm a Catholic or you can't understand me because I have dark skin or light skin. It's irrelevant. We're all people. We're all people and we got to band together and we got to work this stuff out because we are in a spiritual warfare, people. We are. We are. And, you know, as long as you can have seething thoughts of negativity, then, you know, there's always room for the devil to creep in. 
you know, we have to stop thinking about putting ourselves in boxes. We're people. It doesn't matter if you're gay. It doesn't matter. It, who cares? The only person that cares about it is you. Is you. You're the only one that thinks that everybody's looking at you. Or you're the only one that, that thinks. And you know, really, it comes back like, yeah. We have, to, we have to talk about these things. And we have to open our scope. Because if we stay in a mindset or an oppressive mindset or a constant reactive mindset or we're on defense because we feel like we're being attacked, then nothing ever gets accomplished. But I'm here to tell you that all of these people from these old bloodlines were living around the Mediterranean basin. You know, they were all around there, North Africa, all the way up and into uh, you know, the Iberian Peninsula. That's where they went. They all went from this area around the Mediterranean Basin. It was a huge trading hub. And they were rich as hell. Because they were mining minerals and gold and silver. And so, you know, uh, they had to get out of there. They all went to Iberia. They were there in Iberia. And the king that was in Iberia at the time, he converted to Christianity. And I've talked about this in one of my other videos about the Mirian kings. He converted to Christianity by St. Nino's, converted him. And then they came to America. They came to America between the six and seven hundreds. And there's a lot of channels on YouTube that have content about this. And, and you, I think that they're finally starting to pin down the time frame. But I know from my own personal experience, from seeing things that were in my family's homes, all the way back, uh, so there's a fireplace, there's a mantelpiece in one of the homes that my family lived in, and it has the Julian calendar, seven, uh, six, 749, 749, I think it is. I've, I've talked about another one of the videos. But they were all in Iberia. They were all in Iberia. Tartaria was Iberia. Atlantis was in Iberia. The Atlantean people were people that were Tartarian they were from the Garden of Eden. They were from the Garden of Eden. They were left over from the Garden of Eden. And you know, a lot of black fam families that have kids and, and siblings and parents that have red hair. That's why. You got the spiritual upgrade through Adam and Eve 38,000 years ago. Okay? So step into your purpose, people. Let's not have walls keeping us from being able to talk. Let's not make, let's not, let's not be able to step out of our own selves so we can talk about this stuff. We got a lot of healing to do, folks. We got a lot of healing to do, you know? So, you know, these, these, this group of people from Iberia, they were lost, in, they were leftover Atlantean people. And, you know, they had a high level of skill, technology. They were amazing architects. They came here and they built all these beautiful structures. Why do you think we have some of these places that look kind of like mosque? Well, that's because the Moorish people built them. I mean, come on, give me a break. They, they went with that design, that was Berber. And then we have Greek and we have Spanish and we have Roman. We have so many different kinds of architecture here. And it's an amalgamation. It's because they're all together. It was a group of people that lived together and thrived together. It wasn't a group that was all divided. But it did get divided in the end. And you know by who? By Lucifer. By Lucifer. Lucifer and Satan. And if you really want to have your eyes open, you got to read the Urantia book. U-R-A-N-T-I-A. -A. That book will change your life. That book will change your life. It really will. You know, I've been reading the Bible for a long, long time. And I've always felt like a lot of things didn't make sense. But this book really ties everything in together. It gives you direction. I mean, I can understand so much more now knowing that it was Jesus Christ, Michael, that it was Archangel Michael, who's been coming back over and over again to this planet in a human form to try to help us get our shit straight. I mean, seriously, seriously. So, you know, I mean, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? What do you think it's going to take for people to be able to have this really important conversation?
We really need to have this conversation. We've got to put a, aside everything that we've ever been spoon fed because most of it is baloney. It's lies. It's lies. And I can tell you that when we all come down to it, we're the same. You know, and I've had some pretty deep conversations because my best friend, she was African American. And, you know, we talked about all of those things and, and she's gone on to the other side, you know, and I miss her terribly. But I'm really glad that I had that friendship with her because it really taught me a lot of how we have been conditioned to hate each other. I mean, come on. At one time, we were all in love with each other. But you got to divide people. You got to divide people so you can take over. You know, I mean, just like with Thomas Jefferson, is it so freaking hard to believe that him and Sally Hemings were in love? I mean, come on. He loved her. She loved him. They had children. I mean, they bonded. They'd been together forever. They bonded over grief. And, you know, when you bond over grief, it can really bring you close. It can really bring you close. I'm sure that you know someone that's bonded with someone in grief. Yes, it happens. It happens because we become very vulnerable in, in a grief setting. And we need nurturing. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't find it far fetched. I don't find it far fetched because you know my family knew where they came from. They said we have been. That was our motto. We have been. We knew where we've been. We knew that all this stuff was nonsense. You know, and and Thomas Jefferson, he was really upset that they didn't that they didn't want to abolish the whole slavery movement when he drafted the Declaration. And he said he kept all this his notes because they were lining through all this stuff, and he was pissed. He was pissed, you know, and then there were all of these unbelievable laws and people were bound. People were bound. And if you didn't follow instructions, if you didn't follow the laws, you'd go to prison. They put you in jail and they take everything. And then what are you going to do with all these, all these people that are, that you're living with? You know, say you got 70 people, you know, you had 70 people that were dependent on you. You had to have a place to live, you know? And then everybody was under the crown's thumb. They wanted that sugar. They wanted that sugar. Because they were all addicted to sugar. Sugar is a drug, my friends. Sugar is a drug. Do you know that all those little clay pipes that they dig up? Those weren't for tobacco. Those were for smoking sugar rocks. Yes, the early form of crack cocaine was sugar rocks. And it came from Papua New Guinea. That's where sugar was grown. That's where sugar came from. Sugar came from Papua New Guinea, and it was brought back to Europe by Alexander the Great. And that was the beginning of slavery, my friends. It was all about people feeding addictions. So slavery started on an addiction, a crack sugar addiction, that and it totally took up everybody that was in the Iberian Peninsula. If you were Irish, Black, Scottish, a lot of you came as, as slaves or indentured servants. I know that... My son's family did. He was Irish and and one of his grandfathers came here as an indentured servant <coughs> and he ran away. <coughs> he ran away. He escaped. He ran away. And it's funny because, you know, that stuff is still in my family and his and his family karma is uh, being. Uh, how do you want to say it? Uh, incarcerated. Incarceration. Yeah. Yes. Uh, institutionalized, institutionalized in a rebellious streak. But see, if you don't work out the karma, it keeps happening. And my son, my oldest son's father, he spent, he spent a lot of time in prison, a lot of time in prison. And so, uh, you know, those things run in families. And he used to always say that he felt like he had a black cloud over his head. And I believe that he had one of these midway creatures that was attached to him. Because when you spend time in prison, it's evil. It's evil in there. It's evil people in there. And they attract the worst kinds of midway creatures. The evil ones. The demonic ones. And they'll attach themselves to you. And you know, when I used to live with my, uh, my oldest son's father, because we weren't married. We weren't married, so 
I'm not going to try to pretend it was something that it wasn't. We lived together for almost 10 years and we had our son. But the time that we were living together, I had a lot of situations where I would be physically attacked. I'd been physically attacked by some a black shadow creature that was enormous. It filled up the entire doorway and past the doorway. And it was an outline of a big man. And uh, I was terrified that night. I was I was praying. I was praying to God and I'd called my grandmother and I asked her what I should do because my grandmother was very in tune. And she said, you need to talk to the father and keep your Bible. And so that's what I did. I had my Bible. I put it under my pillow and I tried to go to bed and uh, I was so scared. And my internal voice kept saying, just keep your eyes closed. Just pretend like you're asleep. Just keep your eyes closed and pretend like you're asleep. This is what I kept hearing in my head. So I followed it. I always follow my intuition. And literally within seconds, I felt somebody taking their finger and hitting me right here. Like, oh, like that, you know, very mm, like that, poking me. And I thought somebody was in the house with me. I was so scared. There was nobody there. And then I had another time that I was home by myself. Because, you know, when you have somebody that grown up in trauma, a lot of times they turn to addiction. And unfortunately, uh, my ex, he, he was an addict. He was an addict. So he would be gone. A lot of times he would, he would go on a binge and he'd take off. And, uh, and this one particular night, I was so upset because I had to be to work and he was gone and I had to be to work the next day early. And so I was worried because he hadn't come home. So then I kind of knew that he, you know, that he'd went in, that he had fallen off the wagon. So I was really upset with him. And I said, man, I ought to just knock him in the head when he comes in. I can't believe he'd do something so stupid, you know? You know, you go through all the work to get clean, and then you relapse. It's really upsetting for people that that are, aren't are uh, don't have an addiction like that. But I had a different kind of addiction. My addiction was is that uh, I couldn't communicate, and so I would eat. I would eat. I would eat. So I would punish myself by eating. And so I became obese. I, I got heavy. But... Um, to get back to the story, I was thinking that, you know, I was having thoughts I shouldn't have said because I was, I was upset. And literally, as soon as I was saying that, my bedroom door slammed shut. I mean, whap, and then opened back up. Now that freaked me out. And then the third and final thing that happened to me was I was sleeping and I woke up to a huge crash and I see in my window my front window in front of my house. I had my bedroom was in the front of the house. I see headlights, lights shining in the window. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, because this is like three or four o'clock in the morning. All right. So I get up and I look in the window. I mean, it shook the whole house. It was my car. I thought somebody had tried to steal my car. So I go next door to the neighbor's house because I didn't have a telephone. I didn't have a telephone. So I went the next, next door to my neighbor's house, which was my boyfriend's parents. And I woke him up at like 4.30 in the morning. And I said, oh my God, somebody tried to steal my car. I need to call the police. So they come over there. We call the police. The police come. And they're like, well, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking something's not adding up here. And I'm like, you know, I'm in my pajamas. And so I think that they thought that I had done something. You know, that I had come home and drove into the house. And I'm like, I'm like, can you turn the headlights off on the car? You know, because the cops were there and they were looking at my car. I didn't touch my car. And he went to turn my lights off. And we're talking, this is in the 90s, okay? So you didn't have electric lights. You had a button that you had to push, turn your lights on, and you pulled it out to turn, to turn them on. And you pushed them in to turn them off or vice versa. So they went to push the lights off and they were already off for some reason they were on and the switch was not on so I thought that was interesting so they were like well nobody tried to steal your car I'm not sure exactly what happened but there's no evidence here and I was like well that is so bizarre well at the time I worked for a, a big trucking company and so the next day I went to work and I talked to the guy that was over uh, the maintenance he was over the shop 
and I asked him if he'd come by my house and take a look at my car, that something really fishy happened and I got to know what it was because, you know, everybody was thinking that I was out um, intoxicated or something and come home and that's just not me. That's just not me. So he came to my house and he, he looked at it and literally everything in my wiring harness had melted together. My car started up and because it was a stick shift, it jumped. It jumped because I'd had it and I just turn the car off, leave it in first gear and pull the parking brake. But I didn't have the parking brake set. Well, I didn't live on a hill or anything, so it didn't really matter. So I just had the car off and had it in first gear. So when uh, when the car started itself up, it jumped into the house. Sure did. Sure did. So, you know, I've had a lot of times that, that weird things have happened to me, and that was one thing. And, you know, when I, we first moved here, we didn't even get our stuff in the house, and the house caught on fire. Our house caught on fire literally a freak thing but my guardian angel didn't let my house burn down because literally it was inches from catching the whole house on fire it was almost to the window it was started in my attic from a, a fault from a a freak thing with one of the lights in the bathroom and the whole house was about to go up in flames literally when we came home and we were moving our stuff in we would have lost everything but I just, I just got to say that, you know, evil can creep in. And, you know, when you have, uh, when you have these old genetics and these family lines, and, you know, I always say this to my black friends, especially because I feel like this is how I feel about it personally. Obviously, a person is very special if you have to be if you have to be put in a box, you know what I mean? If you have to oppress someone, just like the Irish and the African Americans when they came here, or they were already here, right? You see where I'm going with this? These people were advanced. They were here already. They were here already. They were here already. They were here already. I'm telling you, we can prove this. We can prove this. We can do it. We can prove it. We can prove it. And, you know, we can take away all these falsehoods that we've been told all of all of these centuries. Because it's just not true. It's just not true. You know, we were given a spiritual upgrade by uh, Jesus Christ Michael. And, you know, we got to walk in our purpose, folks. We got to walk in our purpose. So with that, 22 minutes later, my foot's doing better today. Still really hurts. But you know what? Nothing's going to get me down. Nothing's going to get me down. And with that, when you come and find me, I'll be here. Because we're living in the past, present, and the future. All at the same time. So go outside today. Put your feet in the grass. And be thankful. Give thanks to the father and to the mother. So thanks for stopping in. And I'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.